Hello, my name's Kieran Caldo. I was diagnosed with autism over 14 years ago and it's been a big part of my life, but not for the worst. Today, I'm gonna to show you the facts and figures around autism and also bus myths surrounding autism. We also have interviews with people who are experts in the field of autism and also interviews with people who have autism. This is Embracing the Spectrum. The history of autism extends back to the early 20th century, undergoing significant evolution in comprehension and acknowledgement. Over time, the term autism was initially introduced by Swiss psychiatrist Eugen Bleu in 1911, portraying it as a symptom of schizophrenia, indicative of an introspective cognitive state. However, the contemporary understanding of autism began to crystallise in the 1940s with pioneering work of Austrian paediatrician Hans Asperg and American psychiatrist Leo Kanner. Hans Asperg later went on to describe what is now known as Asperger's syndrome, a form of autism characterised by difficulties in social interaction and non-verbal communication, as well as restricted and repetitive patterns of behaviours and interests. He published his findings in 1944, but they were not widely recognised until much later. And Leo Kanner made significant contributions to the understanding of autism by publishing a seminal paper in 1943, which described a group of 11 children with similar behavioural characteristics. Coining the term early infantile autism, his work helped establish autism as a distant clinical entity separate from the other developmental disorders. Around the entire UK there's over 700,000 people with autism as shown on this graph beside me. That's just over 1% of the entire UK population. And now, autism spectrum disorder is prevalent in the UK affecting 1 in 100 people. While its exact causes are still under study, it is sought to result from genetics. Another misconception that people have about autism is that we all have extraordinary talents. Well, it may be true uh, in some cases, but majority of us with autism do not have these special talents. Lastly, People believe that autistic people lack empathy. Well, it's not true what they say, it's just that we put, present our emotions differently towards other people. Some people believe that autism can be cured, even though that it's been proven that it's a lifelong condition. We now have an interview with Darren Jones at the Isle of Wight College, and I'm going to ask him some questions about autism and his role at the college. What's your name and occupation? So my name is Darren Jones. I work at the Isle of Wight College. I work as a one-to-one -one tutor and a specialist exam access arrangements assessor. I have a master's degree in special educational needs and disabilities and a certificate in education. Please explain your role within the college. So I have two roles within the college, one of which is psychometric testing uh, for exam access arrangements. So this might be things that people use in the classroom, like extra time, or a reader or a scribe that can be transposed to exam uh, conditions but it needs to be tested with um, internationally recognised tests by a qualified individual so it can be put to the examination body in the UK which is mostly uh, the Joint Council for Qualifications to say uh, they're okay with it um, for exam access arrangements. I also do one-to-one -one tutoring which is for learners that may uh, require extra explanation for topics and things they're doing or different ways of explaining it that a tutor in a large classroom is not able to do. What experiences do you have with people with autism? So uh, learners have um, worked with, with autism, or I, as the expression I use is uh, autistic spectrum condition, or ASC. Uh, the learners I've worked with are all um, high functioning learners, and my uh, experience has been very positive. So uh, the learners I've worked with uh, are truthful, they are hardworking, um, very reliable, 
uh, everything's been a very positive um, experience. But again, these are learners that are high functioning uh, ASC learners. Do you feel there are any institutional barriers? Uh, most certainly. Um, uh, ASC on the whole for, for higher functioning learners is, uh, can be an invisible condition. So um, if we say, if we see uh, somebody um, with their arm in a sling or something, it's quite obvious they have a, a permanent or temporary disability. For uh, individuals with ASC, not always so visible. So that uh, it could be that interacting with other individuals, uh, it may not be immediately apparent that somebody needs extra support. How do you think pop culture has impacted our perception of autism? So I would say that uh, autism or ASC has become a lot more visible, or uh, say maybe 30 or 40 years ago, uh, a lot more uh, less visible. Um, there are good aspects and poor aspects. Um, some uh, earlier films uh, um, might be uh, said to be, while well, bringing uh, ASC to light may have portrayed um, slightly unrealistic characteristics. Um, the film I'm thinking of is Rain Man where um, a person um, could count cards and stuff and do maths really well. Um, but uh, in my knowledge, there is uh, no more prevalence to special skills in uh, ASC individuals as in the rest of the populace. So more modern, up-to-date films, um, I'm thinking of a couple that came out um, just a couple of years ago, can be quite positive. And what I liked about one of the films was it... Uh, showed how somebody, and this is a TV personality, had um, done great things and used their ASC as a positive thing and a thing for focus and working better uh, and, and having getting through goal, like they want to achieve a goal and that sort of thing. So they explored the positivity of it, how that helped them in their life. The other film was uh, perhaps not so good because the individual seemed to... Um, this was quite a famous rich individual was saying how it was terrible and had held them back and I found that was very poor because I think they should have been saying look what I've been able to do even though um, they didn't they, they kept saying that the ASC was a, uh, uh, a lot of uh, drawbacks to their life which I obviously can't say for the individual what they're feeling but it did seem that uh, as a celebrity they might have been better to uh, be sort of a, a beacon rather than, a, than depressing. What do you think that can be done to make education more accessible for students with autism? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I do exam access arrangements. So there are things where people can have things like a reader or a scribe or extra time or coloured paper, uh, fidget gadgets and stuff like that. I think there's uh, room for um, examinations that are ASC friendly. So uh, some years ago, they used to do examinations that they were so sort of plain language exams. And then the question was asked, why are all exams plain language? But I think there's a, a place for examinations that are less wordy. So for example, if we think about uh, maths GCSE or level two functional skills, they are very wordy questions. It could be like four friends go out for a pizza and they arrive at six o'clock, but the pizza's taken an hour to cook, I don't know, very wordy. I think it would be better if they just said divide this number by this number and multiply the answer by whatever. That would be a lot more ASC accessible. Another bad thing is exams that say choose from these five options and things like that because um, some individuals at ASC will then go into a sort of a, 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 a cycle of trying to work out what will be the best answer out of the five choices and spend a disproportionate amount of time on it. So I think there might be a market for sort of like a, an ASC friendly examination papers. ASD varies widely among individuals with some excelling in certain areas while others struggle with social interaction. Early detection and intervention are key with screening recommended during childhood to access support services like speech and occupational therapy. Organisations like the National Autistic Society provide vital advocacy and awareness efforts fostering inclusive communities. After the interview with Darren, I was able to interview some students at the college who have autism. 
How do you experience the world differently because of your ASC? I feel like with that, um, my routine, I have to be like on a specific routine with that. And if it like gets interrupted, it kind of will ruin my day. And then like, I get random like mood swings because of it. I see it sort of differently in terms of just how you think, the steps you go through to understand something. It, sometimes it's a bit easier to understand something in quick terms. It could just, the logic is different. Your brain's wired differently. So something that makes sense to someone else, someone neuro neurotypical is just completely confusing. But then something that might be hard to grasp for anyone else just might make sense just because it does. It's hard to sort of explain fully because it's different for everyone. I, I, I think it lets me sort of see the world slightly differently, but not so much that it's incomparable to someone else. I'm able to see, th it's not like those things that they show on TV, it's not like Sheldon Cooper or whatever BBC Sherlock was doing. It's just slightly different than someone else. It's not some super, so don't make me think like it's a superpower. It's just one of those things, it's just the way I've always seen the world. So it's sort of hard to imagine what it's like not seeing it like that. What are some of the challenges you face in daily life and how do you overcome them? I struggle with socialising and making friends because of it. Um, and it kind of, I, the ways that I would like overcome it is either if I would like, if they have the same like interest as me, I'd try maybe start up a conversation with them. I think some of the challenges is just trying to sort of level with anyone not on the spectrum because it creates an issue. I think one of the more obvious things to deal with is just not picking up a social cue, which in like my day-to-day -day life, on average, isn't that big of a deal if I'm just talking to people I've known a long time. But if I have to work alongside or talk to someone who I don't know that well, any sort of form of body language, facial expressions, social cues, just all sort of go over my head, which makes it a bit difficult to um, communicate with someone new and I sort of overcome that I guess by always trying to sort of double check um, that I understand things correctly to try and always get an order verbal confirmation that I've gotten what they or that we're on the right track I think. Can you share some of the things you're passionate about and how does ASC influence these interests? I like, I like games, obviously. Um, I have specific anime and manga I like. So like Jujutsu Kaisen and like Dragon Ball, for example. Um, with games, I like Persona and Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts. Um, and I think with, because like I'm autistic, I feel like certain characters from those like types of series I feel really attached to because it kind of reminds me of myself a little bit with certain characteristics. I like a lot of uh, sci-fi content, I suppose. Things like Star Wars or Red Dwarf, Star Trek, things like that. But also other things like um, Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh. And I feel that, like that's influenced slightly by uh, an idea of collecting, I think, is something along with it. Just having a full collection of things really it sort of enhances it. Like Pokemon, you, you catch them all, which is part of it. And also with the Yu-Gi-Oh, it's just being able to just constantly add to the collection to have the more of the thing. So I feel like that's a big contributor to it. What misconceptions do you encounter about your ASC and how do you address them? Some days with my emotions, I'm really like unsure. So like if I was like really upset, I feel like I might not be able to show it that much. I think a big misconception is like, because of the like how they betray the media, as you know, emotionless, not empathetic in any way, and sort of just basically like a living robot. That is a misconception I come across 
a fair amount. And, you know, I just in the way that I just sort of just blatantly say, I'm still a person. I'm not acting like a robot, like characters in fiction do, which I always feel like has been a harmful depiction. You know, I just sort of bring it up. If they th that's how they think, I make sure to correct someone on that thinking. I try, I, you know, I explain that. Of course, I, th I just think slightly differently. I'm not a completely different species. Are there any specific sensory sensitivities or preferences you uh, have due to your ASC? Depends on the feeling. So depending on how I feel, it will depend on the music as well. So it will kind of affect that. Also the stuff that I play as well and watch. Uh, yeah, I can't stand in large speakers in general. Not because of the actual sound. I'm talking about like those really big ones there, but festivals. Uh, but it's not the actual loudness of the sound itself, but the bass cause of it, the vibrations of it. I can sort of like just, they completely throw me off in every sense. I can't, I can't be near very bass, bassy speakers, I suppose, for too long. That's something that throws me off. So How has your journey with ASC shaped your relationships with friends, family and peers? I feel like with some, yeah. Maybe some, some in a positive way, and some not so much. I, I feel like with certain people I can talk to them fine, but then with some I just feel like I can't communicate that well because my autism. I, f I wouldn't have the friends I have if I wasn't autistic. Like, when I, f when I went, like, started high school, when I moved high schools, uh, when I was being showed around, uh, I was brought by the person, like, the student that was showing me around, brought me to uh, the, a group of autistic people, and I was like, they're autistic. Yeah, and that's how I got to know all of them. What strategies or coping mechanisms have you found helpful in managing being overwhelmed or being anxious? A strategy if you're in like traveling or like if you're on a plane, ear defenders for loud noises. It's something simple. It doesn't, it's not always the best solution, but if you, you're going somewhere and it's loud and you don't need to listen to anyone, ear defenders work. And there's also being by someone that you know, if you're in a, a new environment, having some sense of familiarity has been helpful. If it's, that can be, if there's, if I've gone somewhere new, if there's a like brand of restaurant that I recognize, or I'm with someone that I know, that sense of familiarity, that sense of something I know is always a help. I've been your presenter, Kieran Caldwell. Thank you for watching.